in the 21st century to understand that we might not need to vote with the same technology they were using in the 18th century. That we needed to make it easier for people to vote, not harder for people to vote. This only has one motive. These laws have one motive and one motive only, and that is to make it harder for Americans to exercise their fundamental constitutional right to vote. Period. Any effort to claim that this is about fraud is a lie. Second, while this affects all Americans, have no doubt this is a new Jim Crow era to target minorities, particularly black and Latino communities. As someone who grew up in the South and knows very well the traditions of all of the tactics, both overt and covert, to make it more difficult or less likely for African Americans to exercise their right to vote, I didn't think I'd see in my lifetime that arrow of progress turn backwards. But the conservative movement and the Republican Party have had the gall to go state by state and reverse history. One of the proudest traditions in America is the idea that we have a goal of being a more perfect union. We were founded on perfect ideals imperfectly implemented. And we have been growing with each generation closer and closer to an idea of true equal citizenship. And here we have a party that is willing to rig and steal the political system for their own ends at the expense of the most fundamental constitutional right to exercise your right to vote, to have a voice in the election. This has huge implications uh, for our government. What we have is people who are trying to undermine what it means to be America, what it means to have a constitution, what it means to be part of a democracy. These laws are an outrage. People are becoming outraged. And we will peel these back one by one, fighting them in the courts, fighting them in the political process, and fighting it at the ballot box by saying, no matter how high they make the barriers, we're going to find a way to get over them so that this continues to be a government of, for, and by the people, and not of, for, and by the people who want to rig the system. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yes? Uh, so, how exactly uh, would you say, in your words, does the, do the voter ID laws, once again, rig the system? Well, one thing that uh, many people don't know is how many Americans, tens of millions of Americans, that don't have uh, what these laws consider a valid ID. Uh, do you have a, a driver's license, Kate? I do. I have one as well. So for us, it seems very common. But what happens if you live in a community where you take public transportation? Or where, because of a disability or other reason, you might not have ever gotten a driver's license? And you know what else? Getting that license costs money. There used to be something we called a poll tax to try to prevent poor people from being able to vote because it would actually have to cost money. But when you require an ID that costs money, you are effectively creating a new poll tax. Many, many older Americans from a generation where they might not have been born in a hospital may not have the kinds of IDs and birth certificates and other issues uh, that many of us take for granted. Tens of millions, more than enough to affect the outcome of a House race, a Senate race, a state's electoral votes, uh, face this challenge of uh, government ID. Um, there are many ways uh, that we've seen also in particular states um, where a gun license counts, but a veteran's license does not, or veteran ID does not count. Um, this is a matter of handpicking what gets a particular political outcome and not an effort of saying how do we ensure the integrity of the system. Yes, ma'am. Could you please state your name once again? Uh, my name is Tom Perriello, that's P E R R. I E L L O. I'm the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a proposed way of <laughs> of notifying like impoverished or less connected communities about these voter ID laws? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, whether we have a system for notifying those who um, are really the targets of this disenfranchisement. Um, our organization and many organizations across the country, many nonpartisan organizations, are really fighting this battle to save our democracy on two fronts. One, we want to go directly after these laws that are getting in the way of people's right to vote. And the second is to go straight to people and make sure they have the information to get over those hurdles that shouldn't have been there in the first place. 
So there are efforts by many groups in the community to educate people, to help people get voter IDs where they need them, make sure people can get to the polls. Again, one of the things that, the, that was working was the early voting was making it so much easier for our senior citizens to vote, many of whom found it so much easier to ask a friend, a neighbor, a, a fellow churchgoer, or a family member to take them on a Saturday or Sunday to vote rather than on a work day, on a Tuesday. That's been removed, so that means we're going to find ways to make sure that people have someone in their community who can go on Tuesday. Now, we're not going to be able to ensure everybody uh, can do that, but we are going to make sure that we do both the direct service uh, of what we see as a great American act of helping people exercise their right to vote, as well as fighting uh, these fundamentally un-American laws. So we have seen, uh, as the map showed, um, that this has gone from uh, already about two dozen states have put some uh, bit in, in place, some sort of rule in place, uh, and we have seen uh, a dozen more that have been starting to pursue in this direction. In my state of Virginia, there were particularly high hurdles uh, suggested. They were, we were able to block some of the worst examples, but they still got in some things that are going to make it harder to do early voting. One of the other things we're going to monitor, too, is it's not just the laws in the books, but how they're implemented. One of the things we found when I was running for office uh, was that uh, many of the highly partisan local officials were making grave threats to people uh, about how this could be a felony. You might go to, uh, go to prison um, if there's anything wrong on your ballot or if on your early voting. You stretch the truth at all on what your reasons are for doing it. all things to, to scare people away from uh, again, things that make it easier for them to vote. We want to make sure we're, we're uh, monitoring that as well. Yes, sir. Was this fear of voter fraud, was the fear of voter fraud grounded in anything, or was it just a uh, face for voter suppression? Uh, there is no evidence uh, of voter fraud. Not only was there no evidence, there were people who actively went out and tried to create evidence, and it ended up backfiring on them. Uh, these idiot guys from the right who go out and try to do the sting videos, and they thought they'd found three people when we went out and we were able to prove that all three of them were actually citizens who had a right to vote. Uh, so even when they went and tried to do sting operations, uh, this did not work. So the only voter fraud that's the closest we've gotten to real voter fraud has been by the people trying to prove that voter fraud <laughs> exists. Uh, you were more likely to get struck by lightning than to see voter fraud. Uh, there were been, I think, uh, less than 20 cases in the last 10 years, which is really you know, below what you would expect just from regular human error uh, going on. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes someone shows up at one poll and they don't realize that their, their polling station has moved. That's not voter fraud. Uh, that's simply something where someone doesn't have the right information on voter day. One of the laws said that that polling officer shouldn't be able to tell the voter the right place to go, uh, because that would be illegal. But they have to go find that out on themselves instead of what we've always done in America, which is if someone shows up at the wrong place, you help them figure out. Why? Because we should want every American who's eligible to vote uh, to vote. So again, there, there is zero evidence. And we've seen the smoking gun on this. Uh, in, in Pennsylvania, one of the top-ranking Republicans said, we did this because we believe it gives Mitt Romney a chance to win the state. In Wisconsin, a top Republican official saying, we believe uh, that this will help uh, the Republicans. This is not something uh, where there's an effort. And even more egregious, we've heard uh, leading opinion leaders on the right say that they don't think poor people should have the right to vote in the first place, or they don't think young people should have the right to vote uh, in the first place. So we uh, see this as a reaction, uh, as a partisan agenda, and uh, cloaked in uh, the worst kind of faux patriotism. Can you talk about who's pushing these laws a little bit? Sure. So, you know, while this is uh, partisan driven, and we've seen Republican legislators uh, get elected into office and then try to rig the system through crazy redistricting, through making it harder for communities to vote, um, and knowing that there's a campaign finance system where the richest and biggest corporations are going to fund them, and they want that to flood out uh, the popular vote. There are also organizations like ALEC that are state networks that are corporate funded uh, that help write the laws for the legislators, and they have them on the shelf, and we've been able to see in some cases the exact same one. 
language, 